Well, all right. Good morning. I got a quorum here. I can start the show. Uh, welcome back. It is uh, Wednesday, week one. Uh, we've made it to module four and network security module. So with no further ado, let's get started on network security. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at what we're going to do here. Configure security parameters on devices and uh, look at technology. That whole sentence doesn't make sense. Uh, network design elements and components, uh, implementing network protocols, and apply secure administration principles, and then secure wireless traffic. So, again, the deal is configuring network uh, infrastructure is different. You know, it's uh, working with routers and switches and such is not the same as working with uh, PCs and workstations and so on, servers. Uh, but it's not rocket science either. It uh, just takes a little bit of a little bit of understanding of you know how things work together and uh, the ability to uh, make them do what you want. So let's uh, first of all take a look. And I'll, I'm going to assume I could be wrong. I'm going to assume a, a at, at least a base level of understanding of uh, uh, network infrastructure components. Like you guys probably have seen a router before, and you kind of know what a switch is at least in general. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you're a, com a complete complete noob and you have no idea what I'm talking about, hopefully I'll give it to you in the uh, level of detail you need to move forward. So we're going to be talking about uh, specifically uh, some of the network devices themselves, you know, the router switches and so on. The media, of course, is the wiring. It doesn't even have to be wiring. It could be, uh, you know, radio frequencies in the, uh, in the event of wireless, but we're generally talking about Twisted pair cabling, copper, you know, copper wire, uh, coaxial cabling to some degree. Uh, the utilization of coaxial ca cabling and networking has changed over the years. Uh, nowadays, the uh, your exposure to coaxial cabling <laughs> is uh, generally limited to if your cable provider is your internet service provider. Uh, you're going to get if you're getting your internet service from Comcast or or your local cable provider, that's where you are dealing with the coaxial cables, and of course there's uh, fiber optics, a couple of different flavors of fiber optics. Uh, the network adapter, the thing about uh, computers and networks, computers kind of speak their own language. You know they've got their own operating system. They've got uh, uh, wow, some old school infrastructure, eh, Clay? Uh, so comp yeah, computers speak their own language, and the network, I'm doing air quotes, the network, you know, with its routers and switches and firewalls and those sorts of things, it speaks its own language. So in order for your computer to participate in this network thing, we need a translator. We need somebody that speaks network, and that's our network adapter, um, generally referred to as a NIC a network interface card and don't call it a NIC card because that's network interface card card so that's just makes you sound stupid so don't do that uh, so again the NIC the network adapter that's your translator between network speak and computer speak the concept of a network operating system well you've got an operating system again that's that provides the hosting environment on your machine for other things that you do and if those other things that you do include operating on a network, your network operating system is going to provide those hooks, provide those functions for you to get in there. And as I've mentioned before, the term protocol is a set of rules for accomplishing a specific piece of network activity. And we're generally talking about TCP IP these days. And the TCP IP protocol suite is pretty much a kind of universal thing it's uh, it's implemented pretty much the same way by all your different vendors that gives us interoperability so that a piece of hardware from one vendor can communicate without a problem with a piece of hardware from another vendor because they all implement the network protocols in the same way so again the uh, the only thing missing is you right the only thing missing is your PC or your server those guys those are your end nodes. Those are the uh, those guys connect to our network. These other things, your devices and so on, 
these are your sort of intermediate stops. You know, your traffic passes through a router on its way to another network. Your traffic passes through a switch on its way to its destination. Uh, generally, the routers and switches are not the destination themselves. In, some, in certain situations, they are, but generally, they're not. Generally, it's another end unit like you. A router, a, the primary function of this device known as a router is to logically determine the path that a, uh, an incoming packet must follow to get to the destination. Uh, routers do two things. Well, actually, routers do lots of things, but routers do two main things. They route stuff based on their route table, and they update their route table. You know, those two primary functions allows you know, our router to uh, participate, to uh, uh, ensure a steady flow of traffic. The uh, thing about a router, the router is predominantly interested in what's going on at the internet layer, the, uh, you know, where IP lives, because IP is sort of the language of routing. Now, a switch is a device that operates at what is commonly called layer 2, but switches deal in MAC addresses. Switches deal in physical addresses. So once a switch learns your physical address, maintains that in, a, uh, in its MAC address table, uh, switches are able to efficiently forward traffic based on that MAC address. And if that traffic happens to be destined for another network, that switch is going to... Um, forward that traffic to your default gateway, which is a, a router interface. Okay, we talked about proxy servers a little bit previously. A proxy server, and, and I'm kind of predominantly talking about uh, a web proxy, uh, it's a server that uh, exists between you and the internet, and all of your traffic goes through the proxy on its way to and from the internet, so it provides that uh, that safety feature. Uh, everything has to flow through there so the proxy server has the ability to you know to filter traffic and log traffic and uh, do a variety of things like that. But another thing about a proxy, a proxy uh, is the actual uh, destination of your uh, of your packet. You're you know you're trying to get out to the internet but in the, rea the reality is you're communicating with the proxy server directly and then the proxy server turns around and sends out another packet on your behalf. So it's, a, it's actually a different packet that leaves the proxy server on the way to the Internet than the one you sent out. In a non-proxy server environment, the original packet that originates on your machine is the actual packet that is sent out to the network. And then uh, basically the return packet is the one that's returned to you with a proxy the proxy actually is the destination. It's going to uh, perform network activities on your behalf. And one of the uh, big fun things that a proxy server gets to do, uh, a proxy server may very well have a very large chunk of uh, uh, memory uh, associated with a, a web cache. Uh, what a proxy will do, a web proxy anyway, will uh, store, locally store, all of these web objects from the uh, from the remote website uh, locally, so that if uh, you know this, the next guy needs to go to the same website, the proxy server may very well be able to serve up that guy's page directly without requiring another trip to the internet. So proxies speed things up and you know minimize uh, unnecessary traffic uh, over your uh, over your WAN link. So uh, proxies are pretty handy tools. Uh, a firewall, the concept there, the basic concept, a firewall is a packet filter. You uh, f configure your firewall with rules that the uh, inbound and outbound packets are subject to, and then based on you know the first match that packet comes to in its rule set, Whatever you know, whatever uh, that rule says is what happens, and basically it's going to be an allow or a deny. So uh, that's the basic function of a firewall. But there's different types of firewalls. Um, you know, most firewalls, your your 
your basic firewall definition includes looking at the data up into you know up as far as the IP address your base firewall really doesn't look at the payload really couldn't care less about the payload it just looks at the uh, the layer 3 that IP data to uh, determine you know whether or not that packets a go or a no go but certain firewalls have additional capability they look deeper into the packet they look into the uh, the uh, application layer of the packet to see if the payload is consistent with other factors you know to provide more security so there's a there's a variety of different uh, uh, firewall features functions and features but but at, at its core a firewall serves as a, a packet filter a load balancing device I mean if you've got multiple devices that can handle uh, certain uh, activity like for example let me give you a, a simple example let's say I've got several web servers that all respond to the same address and you know that are all effectively using the same IP address and the uh, the goal is to spread the load across them well depending on how those things are configured you know one of those servers may get you know overworked and the other servers may you know not be getting their fair share of the traffic so what a load balancer is going to do is going to sort of incorporate all those devices into a sort of cluster and then it's going to use its technology to uh, equitably spread out the requests amongst you know amongst each other to kind of even out that flow of traffic makes your network more efficient and more functional and in a lot of situations especially in a uh, small office home office kind of environment you may have a uh, you know a sort of this all-in-one security appliance you may have a device like a perfect example is a uh, you know you go to Walmart or you go to your local you know retail establishment and you buy a wireless router well that wireless router right your link sys or your belkin or you know whatever you know consumer grade wireless router you buy well it's got a router it's got a switch it's got a wireless access point it's got a firewall it's got a dhcp server it's got a dns uh, server it's got all these things built into the box so basically a a single box solution for a variety of your you know basic network activities it's it's cheaper it's you know you've got a single configuration utility for the whole thing uh, and it doesn't require you to purchase individual components and of course I wouldn't use you know your basic you know fifty dollar Linksys router as my primary uh, router in a large kind of industrial kind of routing environment I would actually spend the money go get a Cisco router uh, go get a separate switch go you know apply you know some, retrieve these separate components but but again in, in many situations these all-in-one appliances perform a variety of of functions from a single chassis a single device and, and again the primary benefit there is cost savings but we're the government we don't care about cost you know it's we we print money and we have all the guns so we can do whatever we want or so it seems all right in addition ta -ta. Oh, you know what? Before I go to that, let me just kind of point out on this uh, on this page here, the same uh, the same page where it describes these various devices. There's a brief discussion of uh, router discovery protocols, and then it kind of goes into a little bit of detail about some of them. So it's, it's a very incomplete list, which is kind of sad. And the stuff that's in there is not you know not really that important or critical. But let me kind of explain what's going on there. You've got a router. The job of a router, remember, routers have two jobs. Routers do two things. They route stuff based on their route table, and they update their route table. Now, the, that route table can be updated manually. You can go in, and you can put in the network address. You can specify the outbound interface, and you can you know hard code all, of, all the things. Or, more likely you can use what's known as a routing protocol to have 
your router and the other routers all talk to each other and share information. Back in the olden days, you know, back when we maybe didn't have uh, a lot of processor power, a lot of extra memory in our routers, we needed something sort of lean and mean and fast and, and whatever to uh, get this done. So there's a, an old protocol called RIP, Routing Information Protocol. And with RIP, these uh, routers talk to each other uh, on, a, on a schedule. Basically, every 30 seconds, they exchange their route tables with their neighbors. The, uh, the route is chosen expressly based on what's known as hop count. Basically, if you've got two paths to the destination network, one path has you going through three routers, and the other path has you going through two routers, well, RIP will always select the lowest hop count route as the best route, which is not always the case due to the speed of the links and so on. But again, in a, in a fairly simple environment where all the links are kind of the same and you've got like old guys like me running your network that you know don't want to learn anything new, you might still be running RIP in certain situations. But a replacement for RIP called OSPF, uh, which is Open Shortest Path First, uh, was developed. It's that that one's an IETF protocol, right? Engin Internet Engineering Task Force, and it's based on uh, basically the the link speed. It uses a metric called cost, and it takes a, a, a bandwidth, a you know a base bandwidth, which is you know 10 to the eighth power, and uses that uh, you know divides that by the actual bandwidth, comes up with a number which is known as the cost, and uh, the lowest cost path is the one that's going to win. So, you know, now OSPF requires a lot more resources on your router. Requires more memory because it maintains a, a topology table in memory. Requires a higher processor speed because there's, you know, there's a fair amount of work associated with, with uh, updating your, your stuff. But OSPF networks um, can grow much, much larger. They converge faster. Convergence in routing is very important. means... Uh, if you're converged, that means everybody in your routed environment has the same information. Has you know everybody has the right information. So as one router discovers, you know a link has gone down, I need to transmit that information to everybody else as quickly as possible to get those route tables updated, so I'm not sending packets to their doom. You know, so and then of course if you're a Cisco guy, there's a, a protocol called EIGRP, uh, Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, which is currently sort of the best on the market. It's the fastest uh, protocol, converges the fastest. It's real easy to set up, but it's Cisco proprietary. So that's, you know, in fact, organizations will purchase Cisco devices literally just so they can run EIGRP. It's kind of that good. But if there's a point to all this, the point is uh, in order for my neighboring routers to uh, update themselves uh, automatically there's that word automatically to update themselves automatically a routing protocol is selected based on whatever factors you choose for the selection criteria uh, a router protocol is selected and then you just kind of you know you configure you know how your routing protocol works and you just kind of walk away you know hands off and uh, just let your routing protocol do all the monkey work for you. So again, there's a there's a short, uh, unnecessarily dense discussion about it here in the uh, in the book. But again, we'll talk in a little bit more detail about some of those routing protocols. But again, that's what that's what makes routers you know do what they do. All right, let's press on to this network analysis tools. Now, I don't understand it. The, uh, the Network Plus class uh, has, a, uh, has a reference to something called a sniffer. And a sniffer is a, either a physical device running some, you know, some software or basically some piece of software that captures network traffic for further analysis. It captures traffic and allows you to analyze that traffic. Now, a protocol analyzer does exactly the same thing. It's the same thing. So a sniffer and a protocol analyzer at the end of the day kind of do the same thing. It's kind of goofy to even have two different terms to describe them like this. Although the term sniffer 
typically applies to a, a hardware solution. Uh, there's a company called Data General has a tool called the uh, Sniffer. I can't remember if there's anything more complex than that. But it's a piece of hardware that uh, you know you carry around with you and plug into the network to capture these packets. But uh, a standard protocol analyzer, something like Wireshark, which is freely downloadable and which you shall not install in your government network, by the way, uh, will do the same thing, you know, as as a software platform. So the point is, these things capture traffic for further analysis, uh, and that's what they do. They they enable enable you to read the contents of you know each packet that that uh, is captured uh, on the network now a spam filter is just what it sounds like there's nothing fancy about a spam filter okay there's a pretty good section of the of the uh, course set up to describe intrusion detection systems IDS's the concept of an intrusion detection system now the, the uh, terminology becomes kind of critical here intrusion detection systems will do three things. They will detect the uh, whatever it is they're configured to detect and we'll talk about that. They'll detect, they will log, you know, they'll write a log entry based on what they, you know, what they found and they will alert, you know, basically send a message to the administrator that something of interest has been detected on the network. Where they stop short, an intrusion, you know, a traditional intrusion detection detection system does not uh, do anything to prevent the intrusion. So these are these are basically kind of logging tools, and they come in hardware varieties. You know, actual physical network sensors that you would you know install into your network. Uh, the traffic, you know, that, that can handle you know analyzing a certain volume of traffic. Then there are software or host-based intrusion detection sensors. Uh, think uh, think Windows Firewall. You know it uh, it's it can be designed to detect uh, network style intrusions also. So intrusion detection basically detects but doesn't uh, doesn't prevent. So the uh, the basic versions you've got your NIDs your network intrusion detection system and the thing is. This is an actual physical hardware sensor that is on a given subnet and you're generally going to put network sensors on your critical subnets, you know, maybe where your servers are, or maybe right behind the firewall, that kind of thing. Uh, but again, these are implemented as, uh, as hardware devices that, you know, that can see all the traffic flowing across uh, whatever, whatever network segment you're trying to protect. And contrast that with a wireless intrusion detection sensor, kind of the same thing, but it's monitoring your your radio frequency environment, looking for signs of you know rogue access points or you know inappropriate uh, traffic on the network or uh, interference, you know whatever. But think of it as uh, you know think of it as kind of the same thing as a network IDS only. It's uh, you know it's looking out there in the wireless uh, space, and then of course these uh, wireless intrusion detection systems can be standalone devices or uh, you know take a uh, let's let's use a let's use a company like Cisco as, as an example. Uh, they they sell a whole bunch of wireless devices, a whole bunch. They're they're the uh, single largest player in the wireless space. Most people don't understand that, but uh, you might have a dedicated. Uh, IDS, you know, wireless IDS that spends all of its time, you know, you know, trolling around looking for unauthorized signal sources, or you may have uh, your your actual wireless access point spending most of its time just doing regular wireless access things, and then every once in a while switch into this IDS mode, you know, just kind of dedicate a few processor cycles to kind of. Uh, checking out the network for intrusions and going back to be an access point so but the point is the uh, it's essentially an access point that is uh, designed to detect uh, you know wireless traffic 
that you configure it to look for and so on. Okay, conceptually very, very easy. It's basically just a wireless access point that is configured specifically to detect uh, specific types of traffic. Now, then we get into the concept of an IPS, an intrusion prevention system. Here's the the big difference. Notice, well, it's hard to tell, but if pretend that, that, uh, that magnifying glass in the picture, that's my intrusion prevention system. It is in line, whereas an intrusion detection system is not necessarily in line. In other words, all the traffic doesn't flow through the intrusion detection sensor. That guy's simply on the same network as everybody else and is seeing the traffic. But an intrusion prevention sensor is typically in line. So he's in a good position to block uh, traffic. So an IPS does the same things an IDS does. It will detect, it will log, it will alert, but it will also block. The IPS ha is in a position to actually stop the, uh, the rogue traffic from getting through. Uh, you'll see a term called shunning, S-H-U-N, shunning, where an IPS will, you know, actively, you know, block traffic from that network that the attack traffic is originating from, sort of a thing. Okay, so an IDS detects, an IPS goes that's one step further and uh, prevents. Now, before I move up out of this uh, section, there's something else we need to know. Going back to an IDS, there's a couple of terms. One is an active IDS and one is a passive IDS. The intrusion detection sensors I've been describing are what are known as passive intrusion detection sensors. They're going to detect and log and alert, but they're not going to do anything to stop the traffic. That's somebody else's job. Now an active IDS is an intrusion detection sensor that goes that extra step and basically how an intrusion how an active IDS does its job he will detect the uh, the traffic and he will contact the firewall and say hey firewall I need you to add a new rule to your rule set to stop traffic coming from this subnet so even though the the active IDS is not blocking the traffic itself it's working in conjunction with your firewall to cause that traffic to be blocked. So you know, there are those who argue that an active IDS is really an IPS, and you can argue that all day. But what I want you to take away, the takeaway, is that in any case, an IDS is not in line. It's simply on, it's simply on that subnet and receiving traffic, whereas an IPS, an intrusion prevention sensor, is literally a choke point. It's it's online and all traffic is funneled through the IPS on its way to its you know where else it's going. So again, that's that has uh, advantages in its ability to uh, combat uh, traffic by itself. So just kind of be aware of the differences between the two. So in in exactly the same way a network IDS works. A network IPS works the same way. I mean, the, the goal there is for this particular device to provide broad protection for the entire network. Now, each, each machine on the network has like a specific function. You know, each server has a specific audience. You know, each workstation is operated a little bit differently. The point is, uh, this network device can't really provide that fine-grained level of control that that would be appropriate for each and every individual machine. That's where your host-based IPSs come in, your HIPs, you know. Uh, but the NIPs, the network, the network devices provide broad protection for the whole network, whereas your host-based or your HIPs provides specific protection for a specific machine. And yes, those things work together very nicely. Uh, the network kind of provides the broad coverage, and that host base provides the more fine-grained coverage for that specific machine. Uh, so let me go through the, the litany here. So I got my network intrusion prevention sensor. I've got my wireless intrusion prevention sensor, which is, you know, uh, 
you may very well have it kind of set up the same way. Uh, but his job, the, the wireless intrusion prevention sensor, his primary function is to identify rogue access points. We talked about those guys yesterday. And a rogue access point is an access point that's not supposed to be there. It can be, you know, installed by a user who's not following proper procedures, or it can be installed by some criminal element that's, you know, that has criminal intentions. Either way, our wireless intrusion prevention sensors, the primary job of that guy is to detect uh, rogue access points. Okay, now all of these devices, all of your intrusion sensors, you know, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, all of these sensors, before you can, uh, you know, before they're functional, you, you can't just go to the store, buy the, buy the device, bring it back to the office, take it out of the box, plug it in and go home. It doesn't work like that. You have to, uh, you have to tune your sensor to become aware of, you know, how your network functions and what kind of traffic's on there, what it's, lo what it's looking for. So there's some uh, different criteria that you use to make those selections. The first one, the easiest one, is signature-based. And if, when you're thinking signature-based detection, what you should be thinking, see here I'm, I'm putting words in your head, what you should be thinking is antivirus. That's how antivirus works. Uh, the antivirus vendor will, will uh, deploy a signature file because basically a, a virus has a very specific you know way that it works and performs in a very specific you know uh, way so if you see that exact pattern of activity chances are pretty good that that particular virus is in a, is in effect so effectively an anomaly based and I'm sorry I'm sorry a signature based uh, detection system is looking for uh, s specific exact patterns of activity the type you would find in an antivirus situation so that was easy essentially antivirus then you got your behavior based systems uh, your behavior based systems these are the ones that you know what I've got to learn and it might take me a week or two weeks of being online to actually you know, get a feel for how my network traffic works. You know, what what patterns of activity uh, my network uh, participates in. You know, which type of you know which type of protocols I'm going to find on my network. What the you know what the rough percentages are of these protocols. You know, how much traffic is web traffic and how much traffic is database traffic and how much traffic is some other kind of traffic. So we want our we want our sensor to to learn how the network operates. So if the network does some, if the network is operating kind of outside the norm potentially we want it to raise a red flag and say uh hello this uh something something weird is happening here now the the thing about weird it's only weird if you have a baseline to uh compare it against you know somebody comes up to you uh at the office and with some number you know in a vacuum and says hey does this look weird to you you'd have to say well I don't know let's compare it to what normal is for that particular thing you're looking at so you know in a vacuum uh, any indicator you receive it you don't know it may or may not be normal so you have to uh, you have to understand that as well so the the network or the uh, the, the sensor you know, learns the traffic patterns and then as there are deviations from those traffic patterns uh, those things get alerted to the uh, you know to the admin or whoever. For example, let's pretend your network has a spike in logon activity at uh, eight o'clock in the morning. Let's just that's when everybody comes to work and logs on. Okay, uh, the system recognizes that as you know as a normal a normal occurrence. Now let's just say that uh, you know there was a. a, a a tsunami that knocked out the bridge and everyone was prevented from getting to work until the uh, you know Army Corps of Engineers showed up and put up a pontoon bridge and you weren't able to get to work until noon 
So the normal spike of activity that occurs at 8 o'clock didn't occur today until noon. And so your behavior-based system is going to go, well, that's weird, and maybe send an alert. And the administrator goes, ah, I understand what's happening here. This is because the, the bridge got washed out. So uh, good job, get back to work kind of thing. So it'll let you know if there's an unusual behavior pattern. Anomaly-based monitoring is very similar, but we're looking at traffic flows. We know what's normal. We know what sort of traffic to expect on our network. Um, if all of a sudden your network is handling an unusually high percentage of a particular type of network traffic that it's not normally handling, or you see you know, a bunch of uh, traffic for some protocol that's not really associated with something you do, that's weird, and we need to uh, we need to kind of let somebody know that uh, I've detected uh, some kind of anomalous uh, activity. I'm, you know, a lot of traffic for a particular protocol that normally is maybe one percent of your traffic flow. All of a sudden, that protocol is is uh, uh, responsible for fifty percent of my traffic flow. Uh, I need to let somebody know about that. And heuristics, that's. Uh, that's where you know your uh, experience comes into play. Um, it's going to be based on, among other things, uh, policies, best practices, you know, those kind of things. So heuristic monitoring is kind of looking for you know compliance with these uh, with these network best practices. It may not be malicious or weird, but it it doesn't follow kind of established guidelines. Maybe that kind of thing. So the point is. There are a variety of different uh, things that these devices are configured to monitor, and these things need to be tuned. These things need to be. Randy's waving at me. Go ahead, Randy. Shoot, hit me. Uh, good question. Yeah, the definition of heuristics. I you know, I don't actually look up the definition, but it's but it's based on. You know, you're uh, based on uh, uh, again uh, best practices and policies and kind of human factors, uh, and it's 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 not. I mean, the others are the others are more uh, kind of hard and fast, sort of numerical sort of analysis. You know, you've got you know threshold values and you've got uh, you know variations in those. Heuristics is more of a. Uh, I guess the, the the just for our purposes now I'll I'll see if I can't find a better definition but it's uh it's detection based on uh industry best practices as you know are things on your network you know operating in accordance with the way that you want them operating or again there's nothing particularly maybe anomalous about the traffic but uh you're not following proper procedures maybe or Things are, or maybe certain, maybe there's too much Netflix traffic on your on your network when there really shouldn't be any kind of a thing. Hard to say, but uh, think of it as a, a way to to monitor based on kind of almost the human factors. That's that's not a, a perfect definition, but human factors is a good way to look at it because that's where the the policy implications come in. That's where the best practices implication come in. I forgot the second half of your question. Uh, Maybe you just uh, hit me one more time with uh, with that part. That is correct. That's where, um, uh, as a as a network admin, security admin, uh, you would you would uh, you know part of part of the reason they hired you in the first place is so your uh, your security expertise can be brought into play here, and you would have to um, recognize that you know this um, you know these readings we've been taking over the past couple of weeks, which included the uh you know the height of the uh, denial of service attack you know by the uh you know uh russian government against our network kind of a thing uh that's that doesn't represent a uh, a uh a true baseline and we're going to have to you know reestablish that so it's not you know it's it, it's not well you know i took my baseline readings and that's it is what it is no it's um it's it's constantly reviewed and and if you need to if you need to establish another baseline because you're also another thing is I mean that's you make a good point in that uh, maybe when the readings were being maybe when you were tuning your device in the first place uh, your network was kind of acting a little bit weird well first of all you have to 
uh, look at stuff over a over a um, uh, significant over a uh, a period of time that's that's representative of the uh, traffic flow. So maybe taken as a whole, maybe that uh, that that anomaly maybe was only uh, happening for a couple of days, but in the course of a couple two three weeks that you were taking measurements, maybe that would tend to balance out. But uh, somebody uh, is going to make a determination to you know reestablish that baseline based on the fact that the current baseline was uh, was improperly skewed based on a particular activity. So you're not you're not locked in. Uh, and if that happens, you just make you just make the adjustment. That's a, it's a judgment call pretty much all the time, and you want the most accurate uh, baseline uh, that you can get because that's what you're going to be judging all these other unusual activities against. So again, the old uh, uh, experience comes into play. You know your uh, your industry knowledge and and so on is going to. Uh, enable you to determine that that actually does need to be done where someone else might not really uh, understand that that's the case so yeah someone will say yeah we have to we have to retake those measurements we have to extend the uh, the length of time that we that our sensors are sort of learning their environment kind of thing so again it's not an exact science it's always going to be uh, subject to interpretation and there's going to be compromises made but uh, yeah, in that in that in this pretty much specific situation you were describing, uh, someone would have to go. Yeah, this is uh, we're going to have to to um, take another another set of baseline measurements uh, because that anomalous activity was pretty much um, headline news for the, for several days and and doesn't really represent how how the network functions on a day to day basis. So does that does that sort of answer your question? Because that's kind of how it actually works. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Roger that. Don't don't worry. I'll edit all this out in post production. Okay, I'm kidding, of course. Um, here's something. Speaking of uh, networks, you need to. Well, first of all, users come in two flavors. Users are in the building, or they're not in the building. If they're in the building, you know you're um, using normal sort of uh, protocols to communicate uh, you're using you know uh, twisted pair cabling and ethernet and you're operating at very high speeds and and you're, you're on the inside of the firewall you're protected blah 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 but if you're out there in radio land somewhere out there in the hinterlands uh, you need to get into that uh, private network you need to get into your internal network uh, using public media See that uh, that globe in the center of the diagram there? That represents the Earth, and that represents the Internet. Or, as I like to refer to it, the sewer of human communication. So the deal is, remember, the Internet is populated by criminals and scumbags, and how can I possibly, how can I, ask yourself, how can I possibly use this, this seething pit of, uh, you know, scum and villainy as a way to extend the reach of my private network? How can I do that? Well, the uh, the clues are in the uh, uh, acronym itself. V stands for virtual, and if it's virtual, it's not real. In other words, I don't have an actual physical piece of fiber between my computer and my internal network that stretches several hundred miles. I don't, I don't have that. I don't have that dedicated circuit. But I have, uh, logically, I, I have that. So I have a virtual circuit, but logically... You know, my, my traffic is going through, you know, my Internet service provider and the various routers, you know, in that environment and so on. So it's going through a variety of, you know, physical hardware devices, but we're emulating a, an actual circuit. So it's a virtual circuit. It's not real. Um, like your phone company, same thing. When you, you know, when you're using the telephone and you're going through the phone company's network, that's uh you know during the the length of that call you've got an actual circuit i mean an actual electrical end to end connection that's maintained throughout the entire call and then when you hang up that circuit is is taken down and then you might call back 2 minutes later to the same number and it may you know the phone company's equipment may route you through a different set of switches establishing that as your circuit for this particular communication event but in vpn it's the the whole concept is hey look it's a logical end-to-end -end connection 
and you're kind of pretending that the uh, the actual physical stuff doesn't really matter. And the way you can do that is look at the second letter. P stands for private, and private means encrypted. So effectively, I can you know I can leverage public media like the internet by encrypting my traffic in such a way that the uh, criminals and scumbags cannot read my my traffic. And the N, of course, stands for network. That doesn't really, you know, that's, there's nothing special about that. So the thing about VPNs, I think you would probably agree that if you, uh, if you were out, uh, out in town somewhere, you know, out uh, off of the whatever installation that you need to connect to, if somebody came out there and, and literally ran a piece of fiber optic cabling between you and the internal network, that would be great. You know, that would be high bandwidth, no interference. It would be perfect. It would be a great thing. It would also be ridiculously expensive to do that. The reason organizations tend to like VPNs is because they're cheap. You, can, you know, the Internet is essentially, I, uh, the Internet is kind of infinitely scalable, which means I can add users, I can add as many users as I want, without really affecting performance for any given user. So the internet is there, the, the infrastructure exists, uh, it's pretty much infinitely scalable, I can add as many users to it as I want, and uh, it doesn't cost that much to create a communication through an, your local internet service provider. So the VPN solution, now there's a little overhead, I mean there's, you know, there's some processing associated with encryption and decryption, you know, there's, you know, and certainly uh, the speeds that you're going to achieve are probably not going to be anywhere near what you would get with a, say, a dedicated point-to-point -point actual physical circuit. That said, uh, it's good enough. You know, it's like, hey, it's it's a suitable connection. It's a, It's suitably fast for the things you typically need to do, which is, you know, check your email or, you know, upload, download a few files, that kind of thing. So VPNs are here to stay, and again, they're pretty much always uh, configured to uh, utilize the Internet. There's a uh, note in the book that talks to, uh, in the, uh, up on the website, there's another, another block in there called Learn To. There's a variety of these Learn To activities, and there's one of those in there about differentiating among VPN tunneling protocols. So there's more dedicated information in that little section that's available on the website to enable you to kind of identify, you know, one VPN protocol from the next. So there's going to be on the test some reference to some specific VPN protocols, which we're going to get into later. We're pretty much just laying the groundwork at this point. And I would uh, uh, hazard a guess that at least some of you out there on a regular basis probably connect in using VPN technologies sound right anybody anybody out there anybody Bueller Bueller hard to say but uh, there you go eh, somebody out there uses VPN so it's uh, again it's a very we'll call it we'll use the politically correct term cost effective it's a cost effective uh, mechanism for uh, for Extending the reach of your private network using public media, which means the internet. Now, let's say you're doing that, and let's say let's say that you uh, have maybe just uh, you know maybe five remote users, you know half a dozen remote users. You know your average router, you know, can handle that level of of uh, encryption and decryption without really affecting performance too much, but. Let's say that your office is a big office and you have to support up to, let's say, 250 simultaneous VPN connections. Well, I don't, so now that would, uh, that would overwhelm my router's ability to do its regular job. So I'm going to outsource that functionality to a device typically known as a VPN concentrator. It's one of those purpose, special purpose, you know, purpose built devices that's uh, designed explicitly to terminate VPN connections. You know, the, the encryption takes place at the concentrator before it heads out to the Internet, and then when it comes back from the Internet, 
it hits the concentrator, that it stuff is decrypted and then you know sent to the router for normal routing kind of thing. So think of it as a as a device that's specifically designed to allow you to terminate multiple uh, VPN connections with one convenient uh, purpose built device. So again, VPN concentrator is kind of the uh, the approved industry standard term for that thing. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, here's um here's something a, a web security gateway. Uh, we've kind of talked about that already to some degree. Uh, it's a device known as a proxy server, or at least proxy server functionality. There's a reference uh, to a, a product from Microsoft called uh, Microsoft Forefront. It's one of their the line of server products, and that's basically their proxy server uh, product. I mean, it's it perform this web gateway security gateway. Let's say that uh, uh, one of the things we want to do is is allow access to the internet to you know certain users and deny access to other users. So you can certainly put those filters in place at the gateway. You can log who's going where and that sort of thing. So the concept is I've got a um, kind of a watchdog, you know, guarding the gates of the internet. And all of my users are required to go through that. And again, you've got the administrative, you know, the logging functions in there and the, the uh, content filters for blocking access to certain um, websites and those kind of things. So, that's, um, so that enables you, the administrator, to configure said security gateway to allow and disallow certain types of traffic based on content or based on you know, a group you belong to, something like some of that effect. Uh, going along with that is the concept of a blacklist. And a blacklist is simply a list of URLs that are that you're denied access to. Okay, there's another uh, some uh, activities in the checklist tile on how to uh, configure those kind of security parameters. Again, there's a lot of extra value add stuff up there on the website, so uh, make sure you check it out. Here's a concept that's implemented by multiple vendors uh, called network access control. Some vendors kind of refer to it as network admission control. But before I get there, uh, there's an activity 4-1 configuring firewall parameters that uh, you'll have the opportunity to do later. This is one of those where you actually go configure a firewall. Another one for configuring a network intrusion detection system. So some pretty valuable uh, exercises. So now we're in uh, we're in topic B of uh, module four, network design elements and components. So okay, fine. So we already know what the actual devices are that make up our network. We got routers and switches and firewalls and VPN concentrators. Uh, we've also got you know our our servers and our workstations that connect to the network. So we're we're familiar with those things. Now NAC. Network uh, access control, potentially network admission control. Uh, it's a uh, kind of a policy-based process that enables you, the administrator, to set up uh, policies, you know, your network access control policy that can, uh, can allow or deny access to your network based on a variety of factors. And those factors can include uh, hardware, you know what kind of uh, what kind of machine you are. I mean, if I don't want uh, my window any Windows 98 machines getting on my network, I can have a, a hardware filter in there that that will identify that and and deny you access. Or I'm not going to let you on my network if your antivirus uh, you know update level is below version you know 1.234 you know or whatever. So NAC that again the concept is you've got a sort of a server where the policies are that you've developed and you've got these uh, these policy sort of enforcement uh, programs on the client machine you've got the corresponding you know policy uh, enforcement agents that kind of are con you know, configured with you know how your system is configured and then when you attempt to connect to the network the network checks you out gives you a health check kind of a health integrity check to verify that you meet the requirements. If you don't meet the requirements, you know if your if your operating system is uh, is 
doesn't have the latest update or if your antivirus software is out of date or whatever, you can be uh, given access, a restricted level of access to a uh, what's known generally as a remediation network, remediation network, which contains remediation servers. So effectively, if if you don't make the the health cut, I'm going to send you to an to a, a subnet which has servers there that are able to bring you up to code. And once you once you're brought up to code, then you can go back through and pass the health check and be allowed onto the network. So you've got basically an unlimited number of criteria that you can use to allow or disallow access to the network. Before, you know, we had firewalls and basically it was more or less, you know, uh, address based. I mean, you know, it's, we, we could block you kind of based on your source address or your destination address or your source Mac or, you know, whatever. But uh, we didn't re ever really look at the details before, you know, what kind of hardware do I have? What services are running on my machine? You know, I'm not going to let you on if you're running thus and such a service, or if you're not running thus and such a service. So it, it's uh, it's ridiculously configurable. All your major vendors have some uh, uh, some way to enforce one of these network access control sort of policies. Uh, but that's what that is. That's that's a, um, a kind of a policy server that uh, maintains a list of of criteria that you must meet to be allowed access. And if you don't, if your machine does not meet those criteria, in many of these environments, you'll be you'll be given the opportunity to have your machine brought up to uh, the requirements before you're uh, before you're allowed on. So that's kind of cool. So you'll you'll see and a lot of things on this test. Also, uh, step out of the um, instructional framework for a second here. The test. Many things on the test are, are just like little random factoid sort of questions. And one of the things you're going to have to uh, come to terms with is there's a lot of acronyms. There's a lot of like three-letter identifiers for stuff. And they may ask you a pretty simple question and then throw up, you know, three different, you know, like identifiers as answers. And you have to know what these damn things mean, you know. Uh, sometimes you can answer the question based on, you know, based on the fact that, well, I know that's not the right answer because I know what that identifier stands for, and I know that's not the right answer because I know what that stands for. The only one I don't know is this one, but I've eliminated all the other answers, so this must be right. You know, that works, uh, that works so many times. So, again, a lot of this is, uh, is playing the uh, uh, factoid identification game. Not that that's, not that that's the best way to... Uh, test someone's knowledge about security, but I will tell you those kind of questions do pop up on the test, so you'll have to uh, become comfortable with your acronyms. And there's glossaries in the book, and there's you know, and and it's described in the in the text in fairly good detail. So, whatever. Speaking of three-letter identifiers, we have a uh, secure topology known as uh, a DMZ which is, you know, named after the demilitarized zone right between North and South Korea, you know, the, where it's mined and it's, you know, there's machine gun nests, you know, kind of watching the DMZ for activity, that kind of thing. Uh, you'll also hear these things referred to as perimeter networks or a screened subnet. Uh, so the concept here, notice, if you will, I have two firewalls. I have one firewall that's, um, that's Internet-facing, and I have another firewall that faces my internal network. In between them, I've got what are you know my public machines. I've got machines that need to be available to the internet, you know, like my uh, public web servers, things like that. Uh, so, for example, I'm using this web server analogy here. I've got a public web server. You can see it; it's right there on my DMZ. Now, let's say on on the internal network. That thing in the bottom left-hand corner, let's pretend that's a database server. It's got a lot of sensitive customer data on it. And I don't need that being accessible to, uh, you know, to those people out there on the Internet. You know, criminals and scumbags, as you know. So let's say uh, a legitimate user comes along and needs to check the status of her order. So the external firewall will have ports 80 and ports 443 open. 
so that, in other words, web traffic can get through that firewall because I got a web server on the inside. I, you know, that would be nice if I could get to it. So port 80 and port 443 are open on the external firewall. Now port 80 and port 443 are not open on the internal firewall. You know, on the you know coming in, going out they are, but coming in they're not. So that keeps my internet people from penetrating the internal firewall and then crawling around in your internal network. So get back to my story here. So my user goes to the web server, you know, goes to the appropriate web page to check the order status. They, you know, they log in with their credentials and whatever. Now the web server, uh, you know, cleverly, you've designed it to not have the customer database right there, you know, on the other side of that one firewall. My web server is going to be able to penetrate the internal firewall to get to the database server, retrieve the data, and then pass that data back to the customer. So my data remains safe yet accessible. I've got um, I've got two firewalls in case one fails. I've got it like sort of a it's like that layered defense we talked about earlier. I'd have to bust through two uh, separate firewalls to get into that uh, internal network. And, you know, those might be two separate firewalls from two different vendors, potentially, to, you know, minimize the uh, possibility of a single exploit being able to take both of my firewalls out. Now, having said that, there's another um, architecture that's very common. Now, logically, uh, this is what you're going to have here. You're going to have two firewalls, an internet-facing firewall and an internal-facing firewall. You might have this handle with a single physical box. In this diagram I've got two separate firewalls, you know, with an air gap in there. But uh, it's possible to get what's known as a multi-homed firewall. Basically a firewall with, uh, you know, multiple uh, network interfaces. I'd have one device with a, uh, a, a LAN port, a WAN port, and a DMZ port. So I can create this logical structure you see on this slide with a single hardware device, which is very, 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 very common in uh, in industry. Now, the primary benefit of said multi-homed firewall is uh, it's cheaper. It's you know cost-effective. There's a single chassis, single power supply, you know, single configuration utility, and and so on. So it's it's uh, cheaper. Now. It's not any easier to configure. It's like literally exactly the same. You have to configure your firewall come and go on the rules on both sides and whatever. But on the on the downside, since it's a single device, potentially if that device gets exploited, that may expose your internal network, uh, which would otherwise have been protected by a separate firewall. So you can accomplish this logical topology with a single physical piece of hardware that's configured, you know, with, with multiple NICs. There's, again, the term multi-homed firewall comes in. And the primary benefit of those things is cost effectiveness. Uh, they're not any more secure. In fact, the, there's a, a well-known feeling that they're probably fractionally less secure because of the, the real, real possibility of a single uh, exploit taking out the entire device which would, you know, which would enable you to penetrate both firewalls. So, but anyway, you'll see, um, probably for sure, you'll see some reference to uh, the DMZ on your, on your uh, test. Here's a concept, a VLAN or a virtual LAN. Okay, first of all, you have to talk about uh, a subnet. You know, an IP subnet, right? You've got your your machines have a, de a designated, a dedicated IP address, and everybody in the same IP address range, you know, is on the same same subnet, and they can talk to each other without having to go through a router. But as soon as you need to talk to somebody else on another network, you have to go through a router. Okay. Well, what a VLAN does it stands for virtual LAN. So here's the prime. Here's the primary. Uh, conceptual argument for these things. Imagine, if you will, the switch. Like you see in the center of this picture, I've got a switch. And in the olden days, in the olden days, everybody connected to this switch was in the same subnet. 
So if I had uh, in my internal organization, let's say I had uh, you know three separate subnets. I had a subnet for my salespeople, a subnet for my uh, accounting people, a subnet for my my you know research and development staff. Three separate subnets. I would have to have three separate switches, one for each of uh, a physical subnet. That's conceptually very easy to understand. No problem. That's you know that's how that would work. Okay, now we have come a long way, baby. So now I've got these um, uh, these switches that enable you to create effectively virtual switches within a physical switch. So now instead of buying three separate switches for my three subnets, I can buy a VLAN capable switch, a single switch. So everybody plugs in, even the people on different VLANs are all plugging into the, or I'm sorry, even people on different subnets are all plugging into the same switch. But what I'm doing, and generally this is the way it works, on a port by port basis on this switch, you configure the specific port to be in a particular subnet. Uh, so effectively I've got, in, in this example, I can have three logical uh, switches, same way I used to have three physical switches, but I can recreate that logically. I can, I can create virtual switches inside my real switch. So basically the VLAN, the virtual LAN, is essentially the, uh, the layer two, you know, the MAC address sort of equivalent of the subnet. So basically everybody in the same subnet would be on the same VLAN. And uh, in this example, as you can see, I got a couple guys in VLAN 1, I got some guys over there in VLAN 2, but they're all physically connected to the same switch. Now, here's, a, here's the important safety tip about all of that. The prime rule, the number one rule of network connectivity, if you are on a different subnet than your destination, your traffic has to go through a router, and, you know, a, that layer three process. It, there's no exception to that. Has to go through a router. So even though I've got one physical switch, you know, one box, and all, all my people are plugged into, you know, different ports on the same box, and I've got those on a port by port basis associated with the the uh, different VLANs. If somebody from VLAN one wanted to talk to somebody on VLAN two. I have to go through a router. So in this example, pretend that that, uh, that device at the bottom, you know, that server looking thing hanging off of the uh, switch there, pretend that's our router. Now that line between the switch and the router, that's a, that's a special line. That's called a trunk line. And that's technology taken from the old phone company days. A trunk line carries traffic for multiple phone calls across the same line. In, um, in the switching world, each PC, like you see there, there that's a direct you know point-to-point -point connection to the switch, and the only traffic going across there is the traffic is their own traffic. Now that line between the switch and that and that router, that carries traffic from multiple VLANs. That's the deal. That's what a trunk line is. A trunk line carries traffic from multiple VLANs. VLANs, you configure them specifically. Uh, you know, there's a, there's there's a lot going on in you know router and switching land when it comes to configuring trunk lines, but that's but the concept is the guy in VLAN one is talking to the guy in VLAN two. His traffic is gonna is gonna hit the the router. The router is gonna consult the route table, determine you know uh, which port on the switch to send the guy to, and sends the traffic right back down the same trunk line back to the switch with a different with different information in the layer two header that's going to enable that traffic to be uh, transmitted to the appropriate VLAN. But again, the concept, the, the VLAN concept, the, the main concept is, hey, you can take advantage of this fancy, you know, hardware switch and you can create virtual switches within that physical switch. And that gives you um, a lot more flexibility and you're going to save a lot of money and that kind of thing. Uh, so here's another benefit. So let's say you um, you get your building all wired up, and in the olden days, 
where you had individual switches for each, you know, each uh, subnet. You know, if ever if there was like uh, if you're doing moves, like people were moving from one end of the building to the other or one floor to the next, you might wind up with all your people that used to be on the first floor now they're on the third floor, uh, and there didn't used to be those guys on the third floor. So you might have to get an, an additional switch for that for for that subnet up on the third floor, and you know, and and do a lot of rewiring and so on. Yeah, yeah with uh, with VLANs. You don't have to touch a single wire, so you know once uh, you know once the dust settles and the people have moved to where they're moving. Let's say that guy from VLAN one has moved from an office on the first floor to an office on the third floor. He plugs into that jack on the third floor. He's now connected to a different port on the same switch, and then you, the administrator, come along and say, "Okay, uh, this port is now part of VLAN one. Make the change. Boom, done." You didn't have to touch a single wire. You didn't have to unplug. Obviously, you know, moving PCs around that doesn't count. But you know, once you get to those skin of the wall and beyond, you don't have to. You don't have to physically reconfigure anything. It's a, it's a, um, a major boon, a major blessing. So it's all good. So v, so when you think VLAN, think VLAN equals subnet. So you've got a subnet. And you want all, everybody from that subnet to be on the same VLAN. And that way, that physical switch can be properly configured into as many virtual switches as necessary. And let me take a Cisco switch as an example. A, uh, most of your Cisco switches can support as many as 4,094 VLANs. Now, no one would ever have that many, but the uh, the software is capable of creating literally that many virtual switches so mind blown life is good so again think the the takeaway is vlan equals subnet you create your subnet plan you know the the big deal in a network environment is you determine you know what subnets you need what ip address what ip addressing requirements you have you figure all that out and then you make your VLANs follow your subnet plan. You work out your subnet plan, and then you simply make your VLAN structure coincide with your subnet plan. It's not rocket science. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty easy once you kind of break it down like that. But again, the concept here is, hey, listen, I've got this, I've got this magic box that lets me uh, em employ you know, virtualization technologies. I'm creating virtual switches on this uh, on this box. Pretty neat, he said. Moving along, so the uh, the concept of a, of a subnet or sub network. We have uh, we have what do we have? We have you know IP addressing issues, and again the uh, concept being uh, in in the IP world. You may or may not be familiar with the concept of a class A address, a class B address, a class C address. You know they're configured slightly, you know, slightly differently. You know they hold different numbers of hosts and and so on. But the concept is, you can be assigned an address, you know, uh, a class C address. But you may need to further subdivide that address space. Well, you can do that uh, by essentially. Uh, in, in think, think of an address. Think of an IP address like this. You've got 32 bits. An IP address is 32 bits long. So far, you should all be going, yep, okay, got it, 32 bits. Some of those bits define the network part of the address. It's kind of like the street name. You know, Some of those bits define the street name, and the rest of them, that's the host part, You know, the, the unique identifier of the, that machine on that particular network. So you've got a network part of the address, and the rest of it is the host part of the address. So what you can do if, with your with your addressing scheme is you can sacrifice. You can borrow, you know, some of your host bits and make them additional network bits, allowing you to create subnets uh, at the cost of fewer hosts per subnet. Think of it this way: think of a a, a large uh, building. You've got a big empty warehouse of a building. Big empty warehouse of a building. Now it's your warehouse. You can do whatever you want with it. 
Well, let's say you want to throw a wall right down the middle of that building. You, you lease out half of the building to somebody, but you still have half of the building that you can do whatever you want with. And let's say you, in that half of the building, you throw up another wall, cutting that, ha that half of your building in half. And let's say you lease out you know, one of those spaces to somebody else, and you still have a big chunk of space that you can subdivide however you want. So, I mean, you're not, I mean, you're operating within a set amount of parameters. You've only got a certain number of addresses available, but you can subdivide them pretty much however you want. And the, uh, I don't know that it's good news, but on the uh, Security Plus test, we really don't go into uh, the mechanics of subnetting very deeply. Uh, that's uh, something you do in the Network Plus class, which, by the way, ladies and germs, uh, we are now at FSI offering the Network Plus class uh, via Avaya Live, this exact type of training here. And there's two or three of them coming up later through this year. So if you've got time, you know, you know, Randy and, and Clay, I know you guys probably have some, have some time. Uh, you might want to look into that and, and, uh, and sign up for that class. That's, that gives you much more in-depth knowledge of what I'm kind of, kind of hinting at uh, right here. But the concept of a subnet is a, a, a logical subdivision of an existing network to allow you to uh, take full advantage of your, you know, the, uh, the ability to manage your network the way. Uh, well, if you've got a CCNA already, you're okay. You know, that's, uh, the Network Plus is usually, I refer to that as, as a good jumping off point to go get your CCNA your Cisco Certified Network Associate, CCNA. It's a very in-demand cert, by the way. Just, you know, it's, it's, that's always in like the top five, uh, just, just uh, for a point of argument there. All right, so a subnet is a logical subdivision of a network, and how that applies to you is, like, for example, take a look at the slide. I got an HR subnet. I got an accounting subnet. That device in between them is a router. Uh, you are correct, but because uh, some people, some HR departments don't understand that, uh, you know, all they know is here's what I'm looking for, and they don't understand that, hey, look, I've already got a CCNA that pretty much trumps your net plus. It says, well, yeah, but here it says I, you need the net plus. Like, well, all right, I'll go get the net plus just so you'll be happy. You know, there's no real reason for it, but but like I say, uh, that's that's a stepping stone kind of kind of deal. Anyway, back to this. Uh, notice, if you will, I've got uh, my... That device in the middle between those two networks, that's a router. And as I've uh, pounded into your heads so far throughout the entire lecture today, if I'm talking to somebody on another subnet, I need to hit a router because a router then needs to consult the route table to determine the best path to that network. So that's a router in the middle there. Okay, um, now if, if somebody in HR is talking to somebody else in HR, now, this, this, uh, th these diagrams are pretty lousy, too. Notice that I got a router in the middle there, but uh, pretend inside each of those square boxes, there's a switch. So all those guys in HR are connected to the same switch, and all those guys in accounting are connected to the same switch. They, they just don't show you the switch. But those two guys in HR can talk to each other all day long. Why? Because they're on the same subnet. I don't, the router doesn't need to get involved. But if that guy in HR needs to, you know, talk to somebody in accounting, well, that guy's on another subnet. I need to consult my router. My router has to perform the routing to get that traffic to where it needs to go. All right, so, so there's that. Here's another fun concept. Network address translation, which I seem to recall we talked about yesterday. But uh, take a look here. I've got, uh, I've got my NAT server. He's the guy that is running network address translation. Notice that uh, coming out the bottom of that guy, he's using a private address, 192.168.anything. That's a private address range. You're familiar with it. That's probably the address you got assigned at home from your Internet service provider. So your machines on your internal network at home probably have a 192.168 address on them. Uh, it's private. I, can, you know, I, can, I don't need to ask anybody's permission to use a private address. I can just use it. It uh, doesn't matter if the guy in the next building over is using the exact same address space as me because I can't talk to the Internet with that address. 
but I still need to talk to the internet because I'm an internet kind of guy and I need to do that. So I'm using NAT. What NAT allows me to do is that guy, that 12.20 uh, guy, he's going out to the internet. So when his packet hits the NAT server, the NAT server goes, ah, uh, let me save that address. So it takes that 12.20 address, puts it in, a, in what's called the, the address translation table, and substitute, in other words, overwrites his original address with that 24.96 address, which is a public address, the kind of address you need to get on the Internet. So when that packet leaves a NAT server, it's got a perfectly valid public address on it, and away he goes. Now, on the way back, the return traffic will now have that 24.96 as the destination address. That's the address of the NAT server. When that packet hits the NAT server, the NAT server consults his table to find the original address, translates the address back, and then sends the packet back to 12.20. Uh, and he doesn't even he doesn't even know that that NAT thing has even happened. It's it's completely transparent to the uh, to the users. But NAT, this whole network address translation thing, is basically a stopgap uh, measure to enable us to use IP version 4 a little bit longer because like I said before um, you know there's only there's only 4.3 billion addresses in IPv4 anyway seems like a lot turns out not so much uh, once the uh, that World Wide Web became a thing we pretty much immediately put the squeeze on our address space uh, we had to kind of jump through a bunch of hoops to implement this public private address thing and that NAT thing enables you to uh, get on the internet even though you have a private uh, address. So basically between private addresses and NAT, the combination of those two things has saved the IPv4 namespace from extinction. So pretty important stuff. Uh, once we get to IPv6 though, and once we get out of the transition phase where you've got some IPv4 and some IPv6, once we get to IPv6, there won't be any more NAT because the address space is so ridiculously large that every grain of sand on the beach can have his own block of IP addresses. It's a big, big, big space. So, um, yeah, so that's not going to be an issue. Not, not in our lifetime, anyway. At least not in my lifetime, but I'm old and I'll die soon. Some of you guys might actually live to see it, but, you know, who cares? So that's NAT. Here's the concept we talked about before. Remember, uh, yeah, and that's what I was talking about. That's a, there's a, there's going to be some transitioning between IPv4 and IPv6, and we're going to have to interoperate for a while. So the concept of a tunnel is basically, you know, creating a you know creating a connection between these two endpoints and placing, like for example, if I if I need to send my IPv6 packet across an IPv4 network. I have to create a tunnel. Basically, I, I have to take my IPv6 packet, stick an IPv4 header on there. That lets it get across the IPv4 network. And then when it gets to the other end, pop the IPv4 header off of there and then drop the V6 packet on the V6 network and everything's fine. So those, uh, those, there's like four different tunneling technologies. And it's all about uh, transitioning because we're in a, we're in a phase right now where we're transitioning from IPv4 to IPv6. That transition is going to take several years still because you know people are frightened of change and a lot of organizations have a lot of money invested in their infrastructure and some of it doesn't just flat doesn't support IV, IPv6 yet and it's a big expenditure. But it's you know it's it's inevitable. There's no way there's no way around it. It's going to happen, but like I say it's going to happen by degrees and in the meantime we're going to be using these various tunneling technologies to enable us to interoperate, you know, the V4 to the V6 sort of environment. Uh, so, that, again, that's, trust me when I say that's pretty much beyond the scope of this class. It's almost beyond the scope of the Network Plus class. Good stuff, though. Uh, good. Thanks for pointing that out. Now, get back to my other point. Uh, users. Users come in two flavors. They're in the building or they're not in the building. Those guys that are not in the building must use some form of remote access technology to get in the building. Uh, that often takes, um, you know, takes 
the uh, form of a dial-up connection or a VPN connection like we talked about previously. So again, notice the, um, that our off-site employee there working from home using the sewer of human communication to connect to the uh, internal network there. So again, remote access technologies. I've got a, I've got a remote access server uh, on the perimeter of my network somewhere that's going to allow me to connect to that, and then you know do whatever I need to do to uh, drop my uh, my packet onto the actual internal network there. Okay. Now, for some reason, they're mentioning telephony. Uh, in the in the beginning, you know, a hundred years ago or, or more. Well, Alexander Graham Bell kind of uh, uh, sort of created this uh, this uh, telephone concept, and we've been using basically that technology for the last hundred years via the phone company, via the uh, the Bell system of networks and whatever. Uh, great, we're um, we're rapidly leaving the phone company behind. Why? Well, it's a, it's a second circuit. I got my data circuit and my voice circuit. And I'm maintaining two circuits. My voice circuit with the phone company is, well, the phone company technology is, well, uh, frankly, slow uh, compared to uh, some of the other technologies we use. And, but it's primarily a cost-saving thing. So we're transitioning rapidly to, to a, a protocol known as voice over IP, uh, which effectively takes your, uh, takes your voice traffic, packetizes it like all your other data traffic, and just uh, transports it using your uh, data network. I don't know if you guys remember or not, but probably eight or ten years ago, maybe not quite that long, but it's, it's been a while, your internet service providers started offering voice over IP services. And you, know, you had to sign up for it, and it was a new, new big thing. Well, you know, I was, you know, I did, I was one of them. I was, I, I signed up, of course. And um, it was terrible. Man, it was, uh, when it first came out, it, the service was poor. The sound quality was bad. It would, you, you would drop out. It was it was it was not good. Well, that's because the uh, providers really hadn't got a handle yet on you know prioritizing bandwidth, you know managing bandwidth. Uh, and as they got better at it, I mean, right now, who's not using voice over IP? I mean, pretty much it's that's the standard with all of your uh, uh, internet service providers. It's you don't even think about it. The quality of the phone call is perfect. That's never an issue. It's just because they've gotten a much better handle at managing the bandwidth requirements of voice. So that you know that took a while. It took a little bit of a learning curve there. Well, you know, like I say, now that's it's it's coming soon to a uh, uh, to a network near you, <laughs> in theory. So anyway. Uh, Someday, someday the phone company will be a thing of the past. But it's uh, for now. We're, you know, what's funny is is trying to determine. Hey, how's the phone company gonna gonna struggle to remain relevant? You know, because pretty soon they're kind of not really gonna, in their current form, they're not going to be uh, necessary. Uh, and they're a huge operation. They're not want to go gonna want to go down without a fight. So it's interesting. It's gonna be interesting to see how what they do. In terms of you know pressuring lawmakers and doing other uh, you know other things to uh, stay uh, to stay competitive and profitable. All right. So there's voice, uh, voice over IP. Again, that's coming. A lot of uh, operations have already implemented that. The term PBX, private branch exchange, in the old that's a, that's basically um, the telephone companies, uh, an extension of telephone company technology into your operation. You know, you have a PBX machine. PBX box, and let's say, just for sake of argument, let's say you had 100, 100 people uh, in your organization. Well, uh, using traditional you know, phone company connections, you'd have to you know, release 100 different phone numbers, you know, one, you know, one for each of your users. <clears throat> well, you've analyzed your calling patterns, and you've just decided that, hey, uh, we never have more than 20 people making phone calls at any one time, so you know what? I'm just going to lease 20 numbers. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have this private branch exchange uh, technology that allows me to, you know, manage these uh, these numbers as necessary, and and uh, you know, users will, you know, get a number as necessary to connect to the outside world and so on. You know, and these things also handle your, you know, your uh, music on hold and your uh, voice mail and all that kind of stuff. Uh, 
that technology is kind of shifting these days into more of a kind of server-based technology. Uh, using Cisco as an example, they've got a, a very popular technology known as Call Manager. What Call Manager is, is basically a server-based PBX implementation. So not only do I, am I moving away from the sort of hardware uh, box deal that you would, you know, that you would um, place on premises from your phone company, you're doing all that same stuff, you know, with your own equipment using software. So we're kind of morphing away from the old school hard, you know, hard coded uh, PBX machines into a more server based uh, call manager type uh, environment. And the term CTI is some sort of weird industry term, which means computer telephony integration. And there's, and again, there's a variety of things that you normally accomplish with your phone company, right? Uh, telephony and fax, and and now of course we've got you know the data stuff, the email and the web surfing, and so we're, you know, we're, it's integrating all of those different functions uh, into the same network. I've honestly, I've never heard CTI anywhere other than the security plus test. Never seen it anywhere else. So, but you might see it on the test. To virtualization, as we know, you know, separates the software from the hardware. Basically, a virtual environment uh, is where you essentially give the software access to a certain bag of resources. And as far as the software knows, that's that's a separate physical machine. But you and I know that it's uh, it's not really. It's just like if you've ever seen the movie The Matrix. And I was teaching a uh, Network Plus class. Uh, week before last in uh, in Germany, and to a bunch of army folks, and there was this uh, student in class that did not know what the Matrix was, had never seen it. Well, I immediately assigned that as homework so she could understand the concept. But I'm assuming you guys all understand the the concept of the Matrix. It was a, a, a real world environment that was that was uh, virtual, that was not real. It was hosted in this kind of post-apocalyptic nightmare, you know, real world kind of thing, but it made for a good movie. So virtualization is kind of like that. You, uh, you know, within the physical machine, you create the matrix uh, with the virtual machine. And as far as they're concerned, they're as real as any physical machine. They don't even know the difference. Uh, we've already talked about virtual switches. <laughs> We've already talked about virtual switches, kind of the same the same setup, but now we're uh, we've extended that to virtual machines. Again, from a security perspective, there's uh, you know the the virtual machine has the same security requirements as a physical machine, uh, but you have fewer physical machines. However, what you do have that you didn't used to have is a this additional layer of software. You've got this virtualization software. Sometimes you'll you'll see the term hypervisor. Uh, but you've got uh, technologies like VMware and uh, Hyper-V from Microsoft, and, and there are others. Well, you have to manage your virtualization environment in the same way you'd manage any other environment to ensure those other environments stay soft and you know stay a, as secure as possible. So you do have <clears throat> an additional layer of uh, infrastructure now, the virtualization infrastructure layer, that you need to manage just as uh, religiously as you need to manage any other uh, component in your security world. <clears throat> okay. And the concept of cloud computing, which we talked about before. Hey, I've got. Uh, I'm I'm willing to host your services uh, on the cloud. Basically, you you've got a cloud provider. It can be you know. And somebody from Google or Amazon on down to you know, you know, uh, the some you know mom and pop operation, and the and they're going to provide services for you. And speaking of services, there are a couple of services, a couple of uh, deployment models that uh, the cloud offers us. Let's see if they're listed here. Uh, let's let's start with the uh, the public cloud. That's you know that's you know Apple you know you got Apple there you know all your your Apple stuff is is you know in the iCloud or you've got Google or you've got you know you've got these public organizations 
that uh, you know for a fee they'll host all your stuff they'll provide storage you know I just paid a buck 99 a month to get more storage on my Google Drive that's that's a cloud uh, provider um, and that's that's the the obvious you know uh, uh, thing you think about when you're talking about the cloud to people uh, it's just a data center on the other side of your firewall nothing fancy there uh, a private cloud hey man you're um, you know the government's going to be using these things we're going to be uh, using the infrastructure of some public provider but we're going to be providing the management and the and the oversight and and the day-to-day -day operation of the thing uh, even though you know even though that you know I might be leasing space and facilities from some some public cloud provider I'm doing all the management not them you know so private cloud uh, community cloud multiple organizations share ownership of a service that's a community cloud so you know that's kind of a way to kind of spread out the costs and get more you know cost benefit out of a out of this uh, thing uh, you know kind of a sort of like a like a sort of like a like a, a commune you know you've got uh, you know some people grow you know beets and some people grow corn and some other people grow lettuce and they combine them at the end to feed the entire commune that kind of deal it's kind of a communal experience there and a hybrid of course like anything any other hybrid is you know you might be using some combination of a public cloud or private cloud maybe even be involved in a community type cloud but the point is it's just a uh, effectively a data center that is running uh, on the other side of your firewall and you may or may not uh, be willing to relinquish that level of control. I mean, some stuff, you know, some of your super secret State Department stuff is probably not going to migrate over to the cloud anytime soon. But other stuff, you know, less less uh, sensitive, less critical stuff, there's no real reason not to use those uh, services. So uh, you'll see some reference to the cloud on the exam. In fact, I'm looking for the... Okay, the next slide. This is a. There's basically three questions you're going to get. Here's a. If I'm a cloud provider, I'm going to provide you uh, one or all of these services. There's software as a service. There's platform as a service, and there's infrastructure as a service. So let's say software as a service. You uh, need some big time database operation for you know what you're doing. You're a small business but you need some pretty sophisticated database uh, infrastructure well you know it's you don't have the expertise on board necessarily or whatever but the provider will say hey listen I will uh, I've got uh, you know SQL Server you know 2010 whatever uh, enterprise edition and for the low low price of X dollars a month you've got complete full access to to this uh, piece of software so the cloud provider may provide, you know, the software, manage the licensing and all that other stuff, uh, so that you don't have to manage it or maintain it in house with all the associated uh, additional expenses maybe associated with that. So software as a service, think software. Uh, Microsoft right now they're uh, uh, they've got Office 365, which is basically Microsoft Office on the cloud. So that's a that's a software as a service uh, uh, provider um, uh, type. So Microsoft says, hey, for a for a fairly low subscription fee, you know, you know, a piddling number of dollars per month, you've got access to the full range of Microsoft Office products from all your devices, no matter where you are. Uh, and this Office 365 thing is is actually it's that subscription based kind of model is is catching on and people are you know people are using it it's only a matter of time it's only a matter of time before uh, elements of the state department kind of turn to this office 365 deployment model it's only a matter of time not for everything you know your super secret you know area 51 alien autopsy stuff we're still we're going to maintain control of that in our deepest darkest you know development labs but most everything else is going to eventually move to this model. So software, Office 365 is a great example of that. Uh, well, that's true. Um, then there's platform as a service. Um, 
you're running some proprietary piece of software that only runs on Windows NT uh, Service Pack 3 and you know doggone it you're not gonna maintain a separate NT server you don't you know all the people that have any NT experience are all dead now so you really don't want to do it so the uh, uh, the cloud provider hey man I will provide you that platform you need you need to run this application on this platform with these specifications boom done so here's the platform and then you can run anything you want on it so think uh, think operating system when you think platform as a service think operating system so that allows you to leverage different you know you might want to run something that only runs on a certain version of Apple you know maybe some video editing thing and you don't want to invest the millions of dollars on the hardware locally uh, you know a cloud provider might provide you that full suite of you know Apple products that you can then use and then finally infrastructure as a service uh, infrastructure are the things that uh, enable you to do what you do I mean there's the mobility services and the security services and the data services there there's <clears throat> there's a variety of infrastructure items that you kind of take for granted but need to be there so that you can uh, hmm. <coughs> it's kind of question well couldn't we do this couldn't we just you know have a cloud provide that operation to us at our home <coughs> the answer is sure sure they're willing to provide that to you but uh, getting back to my infrastructure as a service, I mean, if I need a, if I need a fully configured environment with all the bells and whistles <coughs> already provided for me, then all I have to do is deploy my applications and whatever else. Hey, I might, I might uh, take advantage of your infrastructure as a service services. An example they use uh, contains uh, you know quality of service. There's a, there's they mentioned that. Let me uh, expand on that. Excuse me. Yeah, we'll be taking a break here pretty quick. Um, the uh, quality of service, I mentioned it before, um, it's bandwidth priority, right? I've got, uh, you know, my voice traffic requires a, a, you know, a higher level of priority than my data traffic does. You know, push comes to shove, I can drop a few data packets. That's not going to hurt me because, you know, with TCP, I get my data packets back. But if I start dropping voice packets, I'm done, you know, or video packets, I'm done. So if I have if I have uh, limited bandwidth, I have to make those hard decisions uh, as to which packet goes and which packet gets dropped. So that's where your quality of service issues come in. Your your uh, bandwidth management techniques. Well, you know, I can you know as a cloud provider, I can I can provide those services for you, so you don't have to manage all that that pesky uh, quality of service nonsense and also your mobility services and your security services all those sort of things so in other words all the things that by themselves don't get your job done but those are the things that need to be in place so that you can get your job done <clears throat> so you'll definitely get a, a, a software as a service question a platform as a service question and an infrastructure as a service question once you kind of get a basic idea what those guys are pretty easy to figure out which one is which and I am there's no way I'm gonna go into this the OSI model before we take a break so it is that's the end of uh, topic A I believe or topic B rather we're uh, moving into topic C it is currently something 52 so let's add 15 minutes to that that let's say let's come back at uh, something 10 you know 10 after the hour whatever time that is uh, in your local economy uh, we'll be right back here at 10 after so Elvis has left the building